G'day there trendsetters. Um, I've wanted to make this video for a while um, and it's in regards to my time in the Israeli military, the IDF, and I think it's appropriate time right now. Last week we had Yom Azikar on the day of uh, remembering the fallen soldiers and terror victims in Israel and also Yom Azikar the day of Israeli independence, 70th anniversary, uh, 2018 now, I left the army 11 years ago. So I joined up when I was 20 to 21. I did something called Machal, which is Mitna Dev Chutz Laaretz, a foreign volunteer. Uh, you can find out more about that on mmachal2000.com. That's the site I, I used to back in my day. I had wanted to join the army from about 16 after I heard that uh, foreign volunteers can do such a thing, with basically that any person of Jewish origin, Jewish background, through jumping a few hoops can do a shortened service without becoming an Israeli citizen and making Aliyah and thus being obligated to do a three-year service. Um, so I was privileged enough to serve in the infantry of Nachal Haredi. Um, don't know if I've got the insignia here. Anyway, that's the beret. And you can see here, Chel Haraglayim infantry. I think that's inverted because of the way I'm using the camera. But uh, everybody's got a different semel here. If you're an artillery, you got a different one. Uh, tanks, you got a different one. If you're a job and non-combat, you got a different one. This is for the infantry. Um, and this is the ugly beret for the Kfir Brigade. And um, my battalion, Nachredi, it's a religious brigade. Uh, men only, extra uh, level of kashrut and the general kind of people in it are more observant, from more observant ranks, potentially from the Haredi community all those falling out of the Kharedi community and a lot of Hezder guys and then a lot of Machal and a lot of foreign volunteers go to that awesome unit. We'll get to that. Um, infantry, basically. And um, so that was the beret. Uh, got a, this was Merch Shesh, 2006 was when we joined. This is the little hat. I don't think I've washed this ever. And it's, it's sun parched. But anyway, so Nakha Kharedi, we served their infantry. And uh, I had a really good time. But there's some things that people need to know about before they join up uh, to manage their expectations, to, to know what, what to, to expect and what to bring and what to learn and what to do beforehand. And that's why I'm making this video. And I'm also making this video as a big up yours to all the neo-Nazis um, and Jamie, friends of Jamie Louis Liardi. He was just a bit of background if you've never heard. Jamie Louis Liardi was or still is a vegan guy. He somehow fell into neo-Nazism. And I made a couple of videos stirring him, and I've done some comments stirring some of the guys. And I just want to reiterate that I am a fully trained infantry soldier uh, who can operate an M16 in my sleep. Indeed, I slept with an M16 for a good part of my life, formative part of my life. I can take it apart blindfolded. I can put it back together blindfolded. And I can definitely put a couple bullets in your center mass. 5.5, 6 millimeter would be very unpleasant. I'm so old, though that the M16 or the M4, which were later issued, is now not really the standard issue infantry rifle in the IDF. It's now the Tavor, which is an Israeli made and designed bullpup, which is an incredible weapon. I saw it when it was being tested in Givati. Uh, a mate of mine had it, uh, and that's a fantastic weapon. And if you're joining now in 2018 onwards, you'll probably be issued with that, unless you're in a different unit maybe, but then you'll get an M4 instead of an M16. M4 is awesome, great rifling. Great rifle. So anyway, I'm just reiterating that I, I'm, I'm lethal. And, you know, you guys play with a keyboard, you dress up in your little neo-Nazi uniforms, and you think you're tough. You're not tough, okay? You're just not. And uh, now the Jews are a hell of a lot harder to kill now that we've reformed an army which used to exist. Some schmuck said something, oh, you've got a beard, you're just a schmuck with a beard. Well, I didn't have a full beard when I was in the army. Here's a little photo of me. A little bass from the past. That's a little trim beard. And again there, little trim beard. Long story why I didn't have one. I didn't grow up Chabad. But first of all, King David, when he slew the Philistines, definitely had a beard. Uh, so did Yeshua bin Nun, so did Moses. So beard, no beard, doesn't make a difference. And uh, if I need to trim my beard or take it off for a gas mask, I would. Uh, that's the only reason you need to take off a beard. So I don't really see an issue of the beard and being a warrior. Um, by the way, yes, that is Tudat Lochem. Lochem means warrior, infantry, combat. And yeah, yeah, that's Palchot Tishim Vesheva. That was the unit I served in, well, long story, but 97. Gedud Tishim Vesheva, that's Nachal Haredi. Here's my rifle strap. Yeah. So, you guys have mouses and keyboards, um, neo-Nazis, that is, 
Uh, real soldiers have real rifle straps and things like that. And just a tip, yeah, it's a little thing for your earplugs. Never bloody shoot without earplugs. I once did that in training. Oh my God. Like I didn't, I, I lent them to a bloke and I went up to, sh and I didn't have time to take them back. Did a full little uh, exercise with, with another five to 10 other blokes shooting M16s. My hearing was ringing, it was insane. Don't do that. You need earplugs. All right, so let's come back to the hints and tips, advice and insights I want to give to people who are potentially going to join. And this can apply to new or less, new people who've made Aliyah and about to serve or not. And also tying it into veganism, because Israel's got a lot of veganism, a lot of vegans in Israel, and the army's actually become incredibly accommodating for that. Uh, I didn't have my boots, my boots are in the garage. The boots are leather, but you can get vegan boots, you can get non-leather um, uh, uh, shoes to accommodate. This beret, the kumta, is, this is um, wool, but they've got uh, synthetic ones for people who are vegan, ethically vegan, so that's amazing. Food-wise is gonna be hard, uh, a lot of the stuff, the quality of the food in general is pretty crap in the army. Uh, you've just got to deal with it. And my one hint I'm going to give to you for training is if you bring a bottle of hot sauce, probably sriracha, sriracha because it's in a plastic bottle, you wrap it in a sock, put it in your back, don't tell anyone about it except your mates, your close mates, keep it on the low low. If you have that, you can eat anything and it'll turn um, my not crub the field rations you have when you're out doing exercises into culinary delight. So that's my... If you take one thing from this, that is before you join the army, you have hot sauce or chili sauce or sweet chili sauce or whatever you like, somehow wrap it so it's not going to break, your service is going to be that much better and my, my, I will rest well at night. So anyway, so first thing to do before you join the army is find somebody who served recently. Again, I've bloody served in 2006, 2007, it's yonks ago, and talk to them. Uh, find somebody, get on the internet, somebody's cousin, somebody's friend, somebody's mate. Because every Israeli has got an uncle or a brother, an older brother or a father who served and they can relate to this. If you're a foreigner, it's very difficult to kind of get your head around the things and it helps to talk to somebody who's similar to you and had that experience, especially recently. So find somebody who's done that, that's number one. Number two, and this is so bloody important, I cannot express this enough because I know a lot of people who didn't do this and I'm very thankful I did this. You need to get your feet checked by a podiatrist before you go into the army. I have the worst flat feet in the world. They almost didn't allow me to pass the physical because my flat feet are that bad. I protested and I said, look, I've got these inserts, I'm gonna be fine, and they said, fine. And I was luckily allowed to go into the infantry, <clears throat> even though with a lower uh, health ranking. So these, these are my inserts, I've got a better pair in. in. Get your feet checked, because you will ruin your knees and back if your feet aren't taken care of. You're gonna be marching a lot with heavy stuff running up and down. It's gonna be crazy. Get your, get your feet assessed by a podiatrist in America, Australia, wherever you're coming from. Shut up and pay the money, get it done properly. If you wait forever in the, in the army to get it done, they'll get it done, but you, you could have done irreparable damage to your body without taking care of your feet. So that's life hack. Army, get your feet assessed. Maybe you don't need them, but if you need any kind of correction, any kind of support, get it done, get it sorted before you're in Israel. All right, next thing is you've got to kind of manage your expectations about the military. Now, and, and, and understand who you are and where you're coming from. The Israeli army is an army of conscripts, right? It's a people's army. People have to join. Of course, combat profile is, you know, combat's the minority of, of the army. Um, the majority of the army is there to support it. But it's an army of conscripts. So some people don't have the highest morale. And also because it's an army of conscripts, they're not expecting any extraordinary basic fitness level. So they really, in the training, it really takes you from zero to hero. From like your first run will be maybe a kilometer, maybe less, um, and they're gonna take you push up wise. They're gonna start you with sets of 10, whatever. So you don't really need to be Arnold Schwarzenegger, Sylvester Stallone, Rambo um, to get in, and don't expect to be turned into that either. You're gonna be trained, you're gonna be hardened, you're gonna learn a mind, a way of thinking, a way of working together with people, a way of being resilient, a way of being resourceful that you will never encounter in civilian life. But at the same time, you're not going to be turned into uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger commander, uh, if you remember that film, if you're old enough. Uh, so that, you've got to manage that. Now, if you are an exceptional physical specimen, unlike me, all right, I'm flat-footed, I'm a bit uncoordinated, not exactly a sports hero, um, but let's say you're an exceptional athlete. I'm going to give an example of a good friend of mine who's an exceptional athlete growing up 
uh, well trained in Krav Maga, he's an instructor. That guy, this, this good friend of mine, he needs to be in a commando unit. He needs to be in a Sayeret, an elite unit. If you're going to do that, you can't do that at Machal. You need to move to Israel, go through all the hurdles, and do the full service, and that's where you will have a fulfilling service that satisfies your kind of desires and your abilities, which are linked, interlinked. If you're really an exceptional physical specimen, don't waste your time in the gdudim, in the general grunts, all right? That's where I served, and that was, for me, was fantastic, because that's my level, and I'm very thankful that I had a great service. I, I think I had a, I excelled there. I was, I was recognized in terms of my service in, in, in an award, and uh, in terms of what kind of jobs I was given and what jobs I was offered. Um, so that was good for me. But if you're a freaking athlete machine, who's doing push-ups in their sleep and is like a quarterback or a full forward in footy or whatever, you probably need to think, reassess joining the Gdudim. You'd be better off in a more professional elite unit, which is incredible, and you will be turned into Arnold Schwarzenegger on steroids. So do that. That's what you've got to manage your expectations. Uh, you've got to realize that your service is, the quality and the enjoyment of the service is completely out of your control. You could be drafted with a bunch of guys who, for all intents and purposes, are douchebags, pricks, bastards, assholes. There's nothing you can do about it. You could be joined, you could join with a bunch of good guys and your officers are, or your squad leaders are absolute pricks. There's, there's so much, you could join and you could get put on a, on a, on a basically posting that sucks, that's boring and you feel unfulfilled. There's so much completely out of your control. But, but that's just the army. You're just going to roll with it, roll with the punches. So manage your expectations there. Understand that not everybody's cut out for it. I had a good mate. He went, it just wasn't for him. And long story short, he had to basically get out for medical reasons. Uh, it wasn't good for him. Uh, understand that the serious stuff that suicide is a very real thing and that there's a good probability that you might lose somebody in your unit to self-harm. Uh, that happened to us and that's full on understand that uh, and that comes back down to the fact that look there's a whole lot of things going on in there and there's a lot of pressure and also people will join with pre-existing conditions and also the stress of the army or maybe they're looking for the army to solve their problems and it's not going to solve them or maybe it accentuates their problems and these things happen it's a serious, it's a serious thing um, but we're going to go slightly lighter notes I made some notes here alright you're going to need to acquire some skills before you join. Uh, and again, coming back to fitness, if you can jog and do some push-ups and sit-ups, you, you're in good stead, right? If you can do that. Of course, if you want to be the guy who tops the unit in all the tests and all, and all that, um, then train harder. Uh, again, though, but if you're training really hard, you, you might not be cut out. You might be cut up for something higher. If you learn how to climb a rope, that, that'll help you a lot. And jump a wall, that'll help you a lot. But anyway, that's different. Okay, you gotta learn how to sew because you gotta fix stuff. Look, I fixed it. Oh, these are my tits. You can see I did a bit of a ghetto fixing. These are army int issued tits. It's the four corner garment. You can see the sewing there. And by the way, if you're gonna go on a hike, don't wear these because I did that a couple times. Coming back to life hacks, you want to just be light when you're hiking with the vest and all that because uh, you don't want to overheat. If you're a guy like me, I just overheat, so don't do that. Um, go learn how to do your laundry. Where's a laundromat in the city you're going to live or if you're going to line up a, a family to support you. There are families who volunteer to take in lone soldiers. That's people without immediate family in Israel. You should, I recommend do that or just know how to do laundry. Okay, because you're going to need to do laundry when you leave base and take care of your gut kiss, if you know what I mean. Um, be comfortable with going to the bathroom outside, i.e. digging a hole and doing a number two. Be, be comfortable with that. <laughs> I wasn't. I'm such a city slicker that I wasn't. But by the end of it, I could go anywhere. Go in your mum's front garden uh, with her watching. So you'll you'll get comfortable. You'll have to. I mean, I you, when you go out in the field, you just got to learn do that. And so I'd recommend doing that, getting comfortable with that. It'll make your life a bit easier. Um, okay, and just one last thing I did. I had no idea about guns until I joined. I'm not an American. I never went to a firing range or anything like that. They teach you everything there. You just need to understand one thing that if you understand that controlling your breathing, slowing it down and pulling the trigger gently, that's that's most of it. And if you do that, and that's just basic ballistics, that a bullet 
goes parabolically, goes like this. It doesn't go straight, it goes like this. There's a curve, and that's why you adjust your aim, because of the parabolic ballistics of the bullet. It goes like that, a curve. So you're firing from here, and the target's here. You might be aiming above or below, depending on how far you are, you are how far away you are, and that's because of the, the parabolic flight of the bullet. And that justifies my maths in high school. That's all I remember, parabolics, parabolic moves. Um, okay, what do you need? You don't need much. This is a really crappy pocket knife. That would suffice you. It's good for cleaning guns and cutting ropes and doing stuff. Get it sharpened maybe though. But that's all you need, something basic. You might lose it or it might get stolen. So you don't want to be too upset if you lose something. Don't invest too much. It's got a scissor that's good to, to cut your thread and needle and maybe your nails and whatever. So that's really crappy knife. That'll do the job. Old t-shirt, you can cut into little bits to clean your weapon. Wet wipes. Wet wipes are also good for cleaning weapon and you oil it, of course. Wet wipes you need for everything, going in the bathroom, everything. You become a baby when you go to the army. That's what the joke was. You need a texter, like a thick pen to mark all your clothing. I got stuff stolen. And luckily, <laughs> you kind of then do arrangements so when you go back to give all your stuff back to get released from the army, they can let you leave. Otherwise, they fine you for not having this like bloody huge jumper thing that got stolen. So I froze my ass off the winter while we were serving because somebody stole it from me. So just mark all your stuff, bloody draw whatever you want, your initials, big, big, all over the place, and nobody will steal it. And if they steal it, you'll see them wearing it, and then you'll beat them up. Get a needle and thread. I had one needle and thread for the whole army. Still got it. <laughs> I bought thread for a shekel in the Shook in Jerusalem. It still lasted me 10 years later. And foot powder. I don't know, like, back in my day, we used talcum powder. Now that's apparently carcinogenic. So if you can use some gold bond and it's not dangerous, that's good, and... I put some talcum powder down in my jocks as well to keep the whole area dry. Uh, but you can't do that anymore. You're going to get chafed. You're going to get chafing to have some kind of Vaseline or something to soothe the chafing or even do preventative stuff for chafing. I wore boxes, get comfortable, some people go commando, whatever. If you wear two pairs of socks um, <clears throat> while you're marching in the boots, that helps a lot. That'll prevent blisters because your, your boots will be really tight. Make sure you tie them tight for your long marches and, and then that'll be really good because you don't want to, if you lose your feet, you're stuffed, basically. Um, other couple things. Take some anti-inflammatory so you have yourself because you're going to get problems. You're going to get aches and pains, tendonitis. You'll probably roll your ankle or whatever and it's better not to have to rely on them for things like that, like a good Advil or something. Nothing crazy in Advil, whatever. That will help issues, but I mean... The problem is you need to rest the stuff to really heal and you just got to trust yourself. You know, you're going to get tendonitis here because you carry stretches and all kinds of stuff in your training. It's going to, it's going to suck, but that's part of, part of the course. Um, one more tip is when you're on your long hikes, this is what I, this is what I did, life hack, is you want to start off carrying the heavy stuff because you got to volunteer. I'm not going to explain too much, but you volunteer to carry the heavy stuff at the beginning and that way when you have a rest, during your hike, during your massa, you then pass it on to the next guy, you then feel literally like a weight is off your shoulders and you're a bit fresher for the rest of the hike, whereas some bastard who's done up to that interval then has to take it on and they're not as rested as you. Because you start fresh with the heavy stuff, then pass it on to somebody else. Keep bloody drinking, always drink. Whenever there's a break, drink uh, and keep drinking. I got dehydrated a couple times. It's hot in the areas that they train. Uh, just bloody drink. Okay, drink, drink, drink. Uh, keep yourself hydrated, and and this is this is the time to take the advice of Durian Rider to keep yourself carved to, and drink a lot of water. All right, and for all Durian Rider said, done, not said, not done. That's good advice. I wish I had and I knew and understood a lot about health and stuff before I joined the army, especially in terms of veganism and, and what you should eat and shouldn't eat. Again, because these army diet is crap. I got iron deficient in the army. Despite eating dairy and meat, because uh, I went to donate blood, and I said, you're iron deficient, we don't want your blood, piss off. And that was a bit uh, scary when he first told that. And that was, uh, I was eating meat and dairy and eggs a lot. And that's just not good. Um, but look, again, you're going to eat, you're going to eat. Um, yeah, and just one last thing, if you're a Chael Baudet, a lone soldier, Two things, don't fucking smoke. Oh my God, I swore. I'm sorry, guys, to break the thing, I swear. Don't smoke, don't smoke. 
I knew a guy who bloody smoked his monthly um, salary. Literally, Marble Reds, pack a day, 600 shekels a month, boom, gone, in training. That was his money, it's gone. He smoked a pack a day. Don't do that. Don't do that, it's not smart and not healthy. And line up a place to live, kind of have a plan of what you're gonna do. You can stay in the lone soldier's house if you wanna hang around Jerusalem. It's pretty good though to um, line up a family that cares for you, adopts you as it were, and they can wash your clothing. If you wanna hang out in Jerusalem, then you can hang out in the Chalbadet house, which is not great, by the way, but they've done it up since I was there. And at least you'll have a kind of safety net. We eventually, myself and some other Machalnikim, um, got an apartment together in Ramot, in Jerusalem, which is pretty good. Um, that's through the, these people that look after Chayalim Bodilim, lone soldiers. Don't depend on that because stuff takes a while, bureaucracy, whatever. You're going to get stuffed around the army. You should just try and keep a smile on your face. Try and, you know, stay happy, stay motivated. Just stay a good bloke. Just pretend you're an Australian because Australians generally make good soldiers. And just, just be a good bloke, all right? And um, you'll make some really good mates in the army. Uh, and you'll have some hopefully very good and positive experiences. Uh, I wanted to start with this, of course, the Israeli army is not baby killers. We're not doing anything crazy. We're there to pretend, uh, to <laughs> pretend to protect. We're there to protect, um, to protect. And, uh, you know, I don't want to get into politics and whatever. You might become a bit disillusioned and understand things and not understand things. But that's part of the thing. That's part of the service. I'm a big, 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 big fan of Israel. Why am I not living there? Why is my family not living there? It's because it's, it's hard. Lech Lecha. It's a big test to get pick up and relocate and leave where you're comfortable, where your safety network is, where your career is, where your children go to school. And and that uh, well, Israel moving to Israel is on our cards. It's not something we'll rule out. It's just something that is, is a tremendous test for all my wife and children and I and the rest of the family, not to mention. But if you're going to do that, Call a kavod to you. If you're going to go do the army, call a kavod to you. <laughs> Just, you know, stay hydrated, stay carved, and stay positive. So that's my advice to all of you. Uh, if you've got any other questions, I probably prefer not to discuss them in the comment section for obvious reasons, um, security reasons. And that's about it. If there's something very desperate, maybe private message me, but then again, I probably won't answer for security reasons. So again, it comes back to my advice to find somebody um, who you can talk to. And again, if you're a pretty jacked guy, pretty professional, have got a security background or an athlete, don't join the Gdudim. Go make Aliyah and try and join an elite unit because you'll have a better service. And I think that would help a lot of people. I had a good mate of mine who served with me and he probably fell into that category, athlete more professional, professional security background, community security, if you know what I'm talking about. Um, they would, he would have fared better in a Sayeret. He later moved into a kind of commando unit and did a bit and had a better service. Uh, that's a different thing. And be prepared to wash a crap load of dishes. You are going to wash so many dishes. Good luck to that. Oh, one more thing. Crikey, we're going on 23 minutes. You should be listening to this at twice the speed. It's something you've got to understand. There's an army culture that hazes the crap out of the rookies, the new guys. And that can lead to a lot of unpleasant outcomes. That you're joining, if you're joining as a machalnik, if you're doing a short service, you might never get to the good stuff because you're being hazed the whole time. It's unpleasant. That culture exists in most mainstream units. In Nakhal Haredi, Nakhal Haredi, it doesn't exist. And that's complex why it doesn't exist. It's partly because people only do two years service in the military and the third year is doing something else that's part of the unit, um, but not in active service. So the guys there aren't as old and jaded and this whole idea of Pazam Perixman, this whole high hazing the new guy, isn't as embedded there. And that's why it comes back to that, that's what's going to dictate your quality of service. If you want to go to Nahal Haredi, ask somebody who served there, it's a great unit full of, like, we had tremendous commanders. What was also good about it is that the average age of people who join are a bit older because they've typically done a couple of years in yeshiva um, or, you know, in the learning. So the, I was 20, so the average age was close to the 20 there, um, 18, otherwise you're going to be with 18-year-olds. 
and the maturity can change a lot. If you're like 22 or 23, you're a grandfather in the army. Like, honestly, like you've got to be prepared to be taking orders from people younger than you and you'll be saluting them. So you've got to be comfortable with that. Um, but 20 was a good age. I'm very happy I did it then. I went to university for a couple of years, then took a break and did that. Um, I'm very happy I did it. Very happy I left when I left because six months later I met my wife. And had I stayed longer, um, I wouldn't have, that may not have happened. I probably do, though. I would have liked to have become a squad leader and taken a group of trainees through, through training and through their first tour of duty. I think that would have been a very, very positive outcome. I've got a good mate who lives here. He's, he's a Yankees, but he married a local. He lives here. In Australia, he did that, and I think it's tremendous. So anyway, you guys take care now. Yalla bye. Excuse the swear words. Watch this on double speed. Get the Chayenu app. I just got the Chayenu app. It's amazing. Um, and a L'chaim for Rufua Shlema to Daniela Basada. L'chaim. And all of you should take care.